Okay, so tonight, uh, my name is Tom Fairbrother. Um, I am the communications officer here at the Coast and Heaths and the Dedham Vale areas of outstanding natural beauty. Um, you'll also hear tonight from my colleague Alex Mordulas, who is our uh, nature recovery officer. Um, he oversees all of our work enhancing um, wildlife habitats in both uh, areas of outstanding natural beauty. Um, the other presenter you'll hear from will be Abigail Blake from the uh, Suffolk Climate Emergency Plan and Green Suffolk. And uh, joining us for the Q&A at the end of the session um, is Dave Smart, who's the manager at the Suffolk Nature Recovery Partnership. Um, so yeah, you'll have a few different voices tonight and obviously you'll have a chance to have your questions answered at the end um, as well. So just pop those in the chat as we go. Um, before I hand you over to Alex, I'm just going to play a short video, um, which should set the scene. Um, and then, I'll, as, just, as I say, I'll then hand you over to Alex. Just bear with me one second. As the sun's rays reach the Earth's surface, some are absorbed and re-emitted as heat. Greenhouse gases such as water vapor and carbon dioxide absorb and re-radiate some of this heat. Increased amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere mean more heat is trapped, warming the Earth. Human activities, especially the burning of fossil fuels, have increased concentrations of atmospheric carbon dioxide by 40%, mainly since 1900. Global average surface temperature has increased by 0.8 degrees Celsius over that time. Other changes to the climate in recent decades can be seen in the warming of the oceans, a rise in sea level, decreasing snow and ice cover in the northern hemisphere, and a decline in sea ice in the Arctic. If emissions continue unchecked, then further warming of 2.6 to 4.8 degrees Celsius would be expected by the end of this century, even at the low end. This would have serious implications for human societies and the natural world. For more information about climate change from leading science academies, please visit royalsociety.org slash climate change or nas-sites.org slash America's Climate Choices. Okay. Um... So that was a brief introduction to climate change. So I'll um, hand you over to Alex now. OK, thanks. Thanks for the intro, Tom. Um, now, um, I'm not a climate scientist, but I am a nature recovery officer for both the Dedham Vale and Coast and Heaths AOMBs, and I'll do my best to describe how climate change is affecting people both presently and how it's likely to in the near future. After all, we are all part of nature and we have to realise that what we do to the planet won't only affect wildlife, but human beings as well. I'll then talk about how wildlife and habitats are being affected by climate change globally and more locally. And then I'll hand you over to Abigail, who can provide some positivity and show how we can all be part of the solution to reduce temperature rises as much as possible in the future. OK, so the, the climate on planet Earth has always fluctuated. So why should we be concerned about rising temperatures today? Does it really matter if the temperature rises by a degree or two or three or, or more than that? Well, in my opinion, but very much more importantly, in the opinion of hundreds of climate scientists, it very much does. Many scientists believe that if we don't significantly reduce our carbon footprints, we could be heading for the sixth mass extinction event on planet Earth. And the recent documented extinctions in the plant and animal world signify the early stages of that. 
So before today, the Earth has experienced five mass extinction events where each of them has resulted in the wiping of the fossil record and has really functioned as an evolutionary reset. The most extreme of all of them occurred 250 million years ago, the, the Permian event, when 96% of species on Earth at that time were wiped out forever. I think what is really important to note about these extinction events is that all but one of them was caused by climate change, resulting from increased levels of greenhouse gas. The only one that didn't was the most talked about extinction event of all of them, the, the Triassic, which killed off the dinosaurs, which is now believed to be caused by an asteroid. Now, the most notorious of these mass extinction events, which I just mentioned, the Permian, began when CO2 warmed the planet by five degrees and was accelerated when the warming triggered the release of methane and ended with all but a slither of life on Earth dead. So a pretty good reason why we should be taking climate change very seriously is because currently, globally, we are adding carbon to the atmosphere at a considerably faster rate than was being released 250 million years ago, by most estimates 10 times faster. So the rate of carbon release only five years ago was 100 times faster than at any point in human history before the beginning of industrialization. And today, there is more carbon in the atmosphere than at any point in the last 800,000 years. Perhaps it's not known as long as 15 million years. There were no humans then, and the oceans were more than 100 feet higher. Something that concerns me very much is that more than half of the carbon exhaled into the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels has been emitted in just the past three decades. And since World War II, 85% of all the fossil fuel burning on the planet has occurred. And despite all of this, the lack of real action on climate change globally has been alarming. If you cast your mind back to 1992, this is when the UN established its climate change framework, where scientific consensus on climate change was advertised unmistakably to the world. So this means that human beings have engineered as much damage to the climate knowingly as we have ever managed in ignorance. Fast forward to 2016, after the signing of the Paris Agreement, we passed the threshold of carbon concentration of 400 parts per million in the Earth's atmosphere. And this 400 parts per million threshold had been for years the bright red line environmental scientists had drawn saying do not cross. And yet two years later, we hit 411 parts per million and this year we've hit 415. So in 1997, the landmark Kyoto Protocol was signed where two degrees of warming was considered the threshold of catastrophe which would lead to flooded cities, crippling droughts and heat waves, a planet to be battered by daily hurricanes and monsoons. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that unfortunately the Kyoto Protocol hasn't been effective because in the 20 years since, despite all the climate advocacy and legislation and progress on green energy, globally we have produced more emissions than in the 20 years before it. In a recent IPCC report in 2022, it stated approximately 3.3 to 3.6 billion people live in contexts that are highly vulnerable to climate change and a high population of species are too. And of course, the potential assaults of climate change do not end at 2100, just because that's the point where most current modelling goes up to. Some scientists studying global warming have called the 100 years that follow the century of hell. I want to change my slide. There we go. So how much has the global average temperature risen by? So in 2019, global average temperatures were 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Only three years later, i.e. this year, temperatures were recorded somewhere between 1.1 to 1.2 degrees warmer. The IPCC predicts the Earth will reach a temperature rise of about 1.5 degrees by 2030. And the IPCC also predicts that two degrees will be exceeded this century unless deep cuts are made to CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions in the coming decades. 
These temperature rises may appear small and trivial, but any rise in temperature, even 0.1 degree, will increase the severity of climate change. Let's take a quick look at how the negative impacts of climate change escalate in relation to temperature increase. What have we seen happening in recent years, which is, is a result of only 1.1 to 1.2 degrees of warming? So 2021 was a year which experienced severe climate change catastrophes. Greece had its worst heat waves for decades that burned nearly 100,000 hectares. In the small town of Lytton in British Columbia, temperatures rose to a national record of 49.6 degrees and days later the town was largely destroyed by wildfire. From fire to floods in that year, Germany had its worst flooding in living memory, where 165 people were killed in July 2021 after heavy rainfall battered the country and neighbouring countries too. In that same month and year, floods in China killed more than 300 people when the central city of Zhengzhou was deluged by a year's worth of rain in just three days. In late August of 2021, Hurricane Ida cut a swathe of death and destruction from Louisiana all the way across the northeastern US, leaving more than 100 dead and causing around 100 billion in damage. Four of the six costliest hurricanes to hit the US, including Ida, have all occurred within the last five years. And what about this year? After eight weeks of non-stop rain, severe flooding has devastated Pakistan. Over a thousand people are dead and millions have lost their homes. The UK had two heat waves this summer. It experienced its hottest temperature yet, hitting a new record high of 40.3 degrees, which provoked 745 wildfires. Somalia and Ethiopia are facing hunger and famine due to drought caused food and water shortages. China saw the most severe heat wave ever recorded, causing parts of the country and its main river to dry up. Parts of the US are also in drought, as is Iraq. Sudan saw one of its worst rainy seasons ever, ever this summer, forcing up to 258,000 people from their homes. So what does a world with two degrees warming look like? <clears throat> well, the ice sheets will begin to collapse. 400 million more people will suffer from water scarcity. Major cities in the equatorial band of the planet will become unlivable. And even in the northern latitudes, heat waves will kill thousands every summer. There will be 32 times as many extreme heat waves in India, and each will last five times as long, exposing 93 times as many people. At three degrees, southern Europe will be in permanent drought and the average drought in Central America will last 19 months longer. And in northern Africa, the figure is 60 months, five years longer. The areas burned each year by wildfires will double in the Mediterranean and sextuple or more in the US. At four to five degrees warming, there would be an estimated 8 million more cases of dengue fever every year in Latin America alone, and there will be close to an annual global food crisis. Damages from river flooding will grow 30 fold in Bangladesh, 20 fold in India and as much as 60 fold in the UK. In certain places, six climate driven natural disasters could strike simultaneously and global damages could pass $600 trillion. Conflict and war could double. Whole regions of Africa, Australia, the US, parts of South America and Asia would be rendered uninhabitable by direct heat, des desertification and flooding. And what about eight degrees, which some scientists believe is the worst case outcome of a worst case emissions path? So thankfully, very unlikely. Well, at that temperature, increase humans at the equator and in the tropics would not be able to move around outside without dying. The oceans would eventually swell 200 feet higher, flooding what are now two thirds of the major cities in the world. So put in the simplest of terms, the hotter we allow the planet to become, the more severe all of the issues become on the right hand side of this slide. So how is wildlife being impacted around the world? 
you could you could literally spend months on end describing how countless species across the globe are being negatively impacted by climate change. Climate change is pushing many species to the brink of extinction or worse, still has even contributed to very recent extinctions. We're going to have a quick look now at how different plant and animal groups are being impacted across the globe. And let's start with the monarch butterfly. Every autumn, millions of monarch butterflies migrate 3000 miles from their breeding grounds in northeast and North America to spend the winter in the forests of southwestern Mexico. Increasing carbon dioxide levels are making their only food plant, the milkweed, that their caterpillars will eat too toxic for them. Higher temperatures are driving summer breeding areas further north, which means the monarch's migration routes are getting longer and therefore more difficult. The world has lost at least 200 frog and toad species since the 1970s and hundreds more face extinction in the coming decades. Climate change is pushing many species to the brink and indeed beyond the brink in some very sad cases. Both the golden toad in 95 and the Cherokee harlequin frog, which is actually a toad, in 1996 were declared extinct in Costa Rica. And it's believed that climate change fastened the spread of a skin fungus which killed them both off. Some scientists predict that if the Earth rose by five degrees by 2100, 60% of all fish species would go extinct. The Atlantic cod is being negatively impacted by climate change due to increased ocean acidity linked to rising sea temperatures, which has resulted in a decline in cod abundances due to a reduction in the proportion of fish which successfully develop from juveniles and adults. All seven species of sea turtles in the world, including the largest species, the leatherback, are very vulnerable to climate change. One of the reasons for this is because they are born without an X or Y chromosome. So the gender of sea turtles, while still in the egg, is determined by the incubation temperature. Warmer conditions produce females and cooler conditions produce males. Sea level rise and stronger storms are eroding and destroying their beach habitats and warming oceans are changing ocean currents, which is potentially introducing sea turtles to new predators and harming the coral reefs some of them need to survive. Some of the species that children most love are succumbing to the effects of climate change, such as penguins. The Adelie penguin is vulnerable due to shortages of krill, which is declining because it needs sea ice to breed and feed under. The towering emperor penguin is at risk, at serious risk of extinction within the next 30 to 40 years. And it's not only animals um, that are under threat, but plants too. The quiver tree from South Africa and Namibia, so-called because bushmen used the branches to form quivers for their arrows. Due to the increased droughts and desertification, models forecast a 76 reduction in its population over the next 100 years. Australasia is being hit particularly hard by climate change and many of its wild inhabitants are now extremely vulnerable. The much loved koala bear is a good example. Climate change has altered the composition of water and nitrogen content of their favourite eucalyptus leaves, making them less nutritious and offering less water. Therefore, more than ever, koalas are risking their lives by climbing down from their trees in search of food and water. And of course, the increase in wildfires is affecting them too. Coral reefs are dying out across the world due to coral ble bleaching such as the beautiful Flavia species you can see here on, on the left. Many species of coral dwelling fish, which come in the most dazzling array of colours and patterns, are suffering as a result. The orange spotted filefish is a good example. The waters in which they live are heating up and they need cool water to live in. This pushes them to move more northward, which can affect their chances of survival. You may have seen the very sad recent declaration that the Chinese dugong or sea cow is now extinct. It was a combination of different factors which pushed the dugong to extinction, but climate change played its part by affecting its seagrass habitat. 
Some of the most enigmatic species of all are being impacted by climate change. Snow leopards are being squeezed into smaller pockets of land due to farmers planting crops and grazing livestock at higher altitudes. Climate change is also enabling forests to move to higher elevations where they are occupying grasslands, which are the snow leopard's favoured habitat. Climate change also makes grassland more vulnerable to degradation, which impacts onto the prey of snow leopards. And climate change is causing leopards to move into snow leopard territory, resulting in competition between them. And finally, the animal that symbolises the ill effects of climate change probably more than any other is the polar bear. The Arctic, which scientists have predicted is warming six times faster than the rest of the world, is losing sea ice, which the polar bears depend on. Loss of sea ice also threatens the bear's main prey, which need the ice to raise their young. According to WWF, if emissions aren't curbed significantly, up to a half of all plants on anim and animals on Earth face extinction by 2100. So let's move a bit closer to home and look at how nature is being impacted by climate change in England and generally in both our AOMBs. So how are our trees and woodlands being affected? This century, there has seen a large increase in the number of pests and diseases attacking our trees, and this is compounding the challenges of adapting to a changing climate. As climate change progresses, some mature trees are very likely to die as a result of both direct and indirect impacts. It's very likely that climate change will have serious impacts on drought sensitive tree species on shallow free draining soils, particularly in southern and eastern England. Extreme rainfall is likely to cause flooding. We will see a higher frequency of winter gales, leading to increased levels of damage and wind blow as well. Wildfires are almost certain to become an increasing factor, affecting the condition and longevity of some woods and forest areas. Our rivers and streams are being impacted by climate change too. River temperatures are rising, which is having significant impacts on watercourses and the organisms that inhabit them. Even small changes in temperature can have an impact on the health of wildlife living in fresh water with species such as brown trout being particularly vulnerable. In some parts of England and Wales, some rivers have already reached temperatures above the lethal limit for young trout in recent hot dry summers. We are starting to see bigger and more frequent flooding events, particularly during the winter and summer flash flooding is on the rise. Rising sea levels will also increase the risk of damage from storm surges and average summer river flows are expected to decrease across the UK, which will lead to reduced water availability and lower water qual river water quality. Some of our most precious habitats for amph amphibians such as frogs and toads and lots of other wildlife are under threat from climate change too. Headwaters, ditches and ponds, particularly ephemeral, are very vulnerable to climate change. Lowland headwaters are suffering from reduced or lost summer flows, resulting in the reduction of aquatic habitat availability. Ponds are experiencing reduced water levels in summer, with increased temperatures and potential water quality problems arising. Ditches are experiencing more extreme flows, increased erosion, increases in low flows and desiccation. Floodplain grazing marshes and improved grasslands on floodplains are prevalent in both AOMBs. These habitats are experiencing increased winter and summer inundation, along with higher temperature and nutrient loads. Climate change is also exacerbating the spread of non-native invasive species throughout the UK and our AOMBs. You can see a picture here um, at the bottom of a plant called Alexander's, which is a highly which is highly prevalent now, particularly in the coast and heath AOMB. Our cold winters used to knock it back and keep it under control, but now they are so mild, it is taking full advantage and crowding out our native flora on roadsides, sea walls, and in woodlands. And how are the flagship species for our AOMBs likely to be impacted? The, the hazel dormouse, which is the flagship for the dead and vale, is very vulnerable to climate change. This is partly due to its habit of hibernate, hibernating in a nest on the floor where it's exposed to changing weather conditions throughout the winter rather than in a more climatically stable underground burrow or cave. 
They are also reasonably picky eaters, and during the active season, their diet follows a sequence of buds, flowers, insects and fruit, as each become available at different times. Climate change is altering the timing of budding and flowering, which is causing the hazel dormouse to become out of sync with its key food availability. Changes in the timing of production and or abundance of fruit could have a big impact on the amount of weight that hazel dormice are able to gain before the hibernation season. And finally, how is the red shank, the coast and heaths AOMB flagship species, likely to cope in a warming world? It has all but disappeared on the salt marshes on the estuaries over the last 40 years, as salt marshes have been lost to erosion and increasing water levels have resulted in more frequent flooding of nesting attempts. However, the red shank is a bird which has the potential to adapt to a changing climate. For this species, it is possible that a negative effect of sea level rise on coastal breeding red shank could be compensated for by a positive effect on wet grasslands, such as a warmer climate leading to increased invertebrate abundance for chicks. There is also speculation over potential benefits for waders, such as the red shank around earlier egg laying dates. Some scientists believe that the increased length of the breeding season could result in some species like red shank either laying more clutches or having the option to relay following clutch loss. So this could be especially advantageous for relatively late late nesting species such as red shank and black tail cobwebs. So on that more positive note, I'll hand you over to Abigail. Who can provide some solutions for us all. Hello, am I right in thinking there's a, a little video of David there, Attenborough to play? There is, oh, I forgot okay. there is, sorry, have a go. <laughs> no, no problem. Okay, we'll have a short video and then uh, we'll hand you over to Abigail. So. Spoiler alert. <laughs> in the last 150 years, the world has warmed on average by just over one degree Celsius. And our atmosphere now contains concentrations of carbon dioxide that have not been equaled for millions of years. We are today perilously close to tipping points that once passed will send global temperatures spiraling catastrophically higher. If we continue on our current path, we will face the collapse of everything that gives us our security. Food production, access to fresh water, habitable ambient temperature, and ocean food chains. And if the natural world can no longer support the most basic of our needs, then much of the rest of civilization will quickly break down. Please make no mistake. Climate change is the biggest threat to security that modern humans have ever faced. OK, thank you. Right. Leading on from that, let me just share my screen. OK, can everyone see that? Can you let me know, Tom, yeah. if you can see that? Yeah, it looks great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so hi, everybody, and thank you to Alex for all that information, a really in-depth explanation of climate change and what the future could look like. Uh, thank you. Um, following on from that, hi, my name is Abigail, um, and it's my job to communicate all the fantastic climate emergency work happening across Suffolk. It's important to remember that although this is what the future could look like if the global climate increases at the rate it is, it is not the only future that's available to us. We as a population can still make changes to create a better future. Sure, we are definitely past a certain point, but we must remain optimistic and not give up hope entirely. There is a future and it doesn't have to be as bleak as this. So I have less than 15 minutes to tell you how you can be a part of the solution. Let's crack on. 
So today I'm going to try and cram in as many really basic practical tips of what you can do to live a more environmentally friendly lifestyle. I'm going to give you some advice and pointers about how to approach being more eco-friendly and I'm also going to show you some cool places to go to find out more information in case you want to dig into this a little bit more. So the most important things to remember when thinking about how you can live in a more environmentally friendly way is that you don't have to make loads of changes all at once and you don't have to do it perfectly. Small conscious changes are better than none. And to be honest, once you start making small changes, bigger changes do become so much easier. Being environmentally friendly and sustainable feels good. So you'll naturally find yourself wanting to do more, learn more, share more and yeah, tell everyone about what you've been doing. The hardest bit is the learning, which is why you're what you're what you're doing today as being part of this webinar. So I'd also like to add this webinar isn't designed to make you feel guilty, ashamed or that you're not doing enough. The very fact you've joined in, as I say, and you want to learn more about protecting the planet is wonderful. And on behalf of all nature everywhere, thank you. Uh, so let's dive into some practical tips, starting with the food we eat and what we drink. So I reckon as soon as I said, let's start with food, a lot of you were probably expecting this, eat less meat. We hear it all the time, but why? So in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation, water scarcity across the globe and ocean pollution, reducing your meat intake can take all those boxes. Meat eaters are responsible for almost twice as many food related emissions a day as vegetarians and about two and a half as many people on a plant based diet. So research has shown that the production of beef in particular is 10 times more damaging to the environment than other livestock. I was sent this graph the other day from one of my colleagues in the Suffolk Climate Change Partnership. So this shows how much CO2 is produced by beef production compared with other food. If you can't see that, beef is that line at the top, lamb and mutton are second, cheese is third and raising cows specifically for dairy is fourth. At the bottom is nuts, apples and citrus fruit right down there. Um, and you can find this graph if you just Google carbon footprint of food. Um, it's pretty interesting stuff and you can really get down a rabbit hole with all that. Um, so drastically reducing your meat and dairy consumption is one of the best and easiest things you can do for climate change. I'm not saying give it up. I understand it could be a huge change. Going plant based especially is a lifestyle choice, but perhaps start by following some hashtag vegetarian or hashtag vegan things on social media to get inspired and float the idea in your mind a little bit. Give meat free Mondays a try or try some meat substitutes like corn or Tesco plant chef or Aldi's plant menu stuff. Some of it is actually really convincing. Um, if you don't want to change your meat intake, at least consider picking up organic meat or eggs. This means that the animals are better cared for in their lifetime. Not only meat, but buying organic fruit and veg means that they have not been treated with pesticides or insecticides. So organic farms can be havens for birds and bees and pesticides can use severely can severely impact the environment and ecosystems. So choosing organic foods is generally better for the environment. On top of this, try and go for fruit and veg that's not in plastic packaging. Single use plastic, plastic that is only used for one thing and then thrown away, like cling film, is just a huge sticking point for the food industry, no pun intended. But fruit and vegetables don't need to be wrapped up like this as nature has already protected them in most cases. Um, so, for example, why would we need to wrap bananas in plastic, for instance? Um, it's just going to end up in landfill or the ocean. Uh, tip number four I've got here is reusable cups and bottles. So if you're going to grab a coffee on your way to work, bring a reusable cup or flask. Almost all coffee shops will fill your own cup up if you give it to them. And some might even give you a small discount as well. Um, so I saved 20p the other day at Norwich train station for providing my own flask, which was nice. Um, the last tip uh, for food and drink is kettle. So only fill up the kettle with the amount of water you're about to use. So many people don't do this. Um, so if you're about to make a cup of tea, but if you fill the kettle right to the top, you're having to use energy to heat up the entire full kettle's worth of water. If you only fill up what you need, not only will it boil quicker, but it's much less wasteful. So this and this are my top, top, top tips out of all of these. They're super easy to do and can make a huge impact on your carbon footprint. So if you're going to take any of these tips away and add them into your life, I'd really recommend starting here. 
Next up, we're going to look at travel. So my focus today is on small, easy, basic tips to start you off on a sustainability journey. So I'm not going to be talking about the best electric car. Um, I'm not going to be telling you to never get on an aeroplane again. Um, these are simply things you can do starting from tomorrow if you wanted to. Um, so as soon as I mentioned travel, you all knew I was going to say cycle more. Um, of course, finding ways to travel that don't involve cars are so much better for the environment. Cycling can also make you fitter, happier, and according to research by the British Heart Foundation, 13% of people surveyed thought that cyclists are more intelligent and cooler than other people, um, in case you needed another incentive. Um, this lovely lady here looks like she's really excited to cycle to work. This could be you, only she's forgotten to put a helmet on, which is a shame. Um, I would strongly advise you wearing a helmet for safety reasons. Um, care, car sharing is another great idea. Um, of course, it's reducing the number of cars on the road, but also you can split the cost of fuel as well, which is pretty significant at the moment. Uh, there's a great app I could recommend called Lift Share, where you can see who else is in your area and making the same journeys as you. And you can travel together and make friends. And it's all really lovely. Um, it's really cool and especially good in the summer if you're heading a long way to festivals and things like that. Um, a lot of festivals have connected with Lift Share, um, so they're pretty prevalent on there. Um, plus, in a rural county like Suffolk, it would be great to have more people on the app. Um, yeah, it's great. It's called Lift Share and that's the logo on there. Um, and I know this next tip might not be doable for everybody, but if you can work from home a day or two a week, this has huge benefits that go beyond carbon emissions from traveling. So, of course, besides there being less cars on the road, if people are working from home, you're much less likely to buy food on the go. That's typically wrapped in plastic packaging or more likely to buy more likely to drink your coffee from a mug in your kitchen cupboard than a disposable coffee cup. So next, looking at tips in the home. So assuming you have a washing machine, washing your clothes at 30 degrees instead of 40 degrees Celsius can be a third cheaper. Um, it saves a huge amount of energy um, and reducing your carbon footprint drastically over time. So for context, if every Londoner switched to 30 degrees, they would collectively save enough energy to power the London Eye 2.3 million times. So imagine if all of us today on the call, not saying there's as many of us as the people of London, but imagine if all of us today on this call um, washed our clothes at 30 degrees for the next 12 months. Can you imagine how much energy we would collectively save? Um, this next one's really simple, um, but switch off your appliances and gadgets at night when you're not using them. Um, obviously not your fridge freezer, um, but things like your dishwasher, washing machine, cooker, Xbox or TV, switch them off at the socket if you can reach it. It reduces your energy consumption and could also save you up to £80 a year, depending on how many gadgets you have. You could also experiment with an electronic sundown, which sounds nice, where you go around switching around, switching off all your electrical sockets um, just before you go to bed or perhaps an hour just before you go to bed. Um, spend the last hour by candlelight um, might even help you sleep better. And last one, next time you break something or move house, instead of heading to a store, try buying something pre-loved to help protect the Earth's resources. So furniture manufacturing in particular is linked to deforestation in areas around the globe. So heading onto Facebook Marketplace or into the British Heart Foundation or other charity shops is much better for the planet. Not only furniture, of course, but secondhand clothing is a great way to reduce your carbon footprint. Pre-loved and vintage clothing is really in fashion these days and apps like Vinted and Depop are great places to find wonderful brands of clothing for so much cheaper as well. And it's really good for the planet. Um, so the internet is full of fantastic things um, you can do to reduce your personal contribution to the climate emergency. Um, so I've gone through some of the best starting points today, but if you find yourself looking for something bigger and really want to integrate sustainability into your lifestyle, these are some things I would suggest thinking about. So first one, do your research, obviously. We all know that the responsibility isn't just on us as individuals. There are huge companies out there that aren't changing their processes quick enough or at all. 
Um, I would really recommend, and this is one of my favourite places to go, a website called ethicalconsumer.org. Um, so they research almost every company in the world and they give them an ethical ranking based on everything from their carbon emissions to their workers' rights to their environmental sustainability. If you're thinking about switching bank, for example, um, head to a website such as Ethical Consumer or even Google to find out which bank is more environmentally friendly, which supermarket, which food chain, even which courier. Um, and vote with your wallet. Uh, another great website is goodonyou.eco, um, which specifically looks at fashion brands. And I think every single fashion brand is on there, actually. Um, so if we buy more from companies that make an effort to be sustainable, other companies will soon catch on. That's the hope. Um, my next tip would be engage with green news and initiatives. So I know climate change news can be so depressing, um, but it's important to stay up to date. I would highly recommend the dailyclimate.org if you haven't already heard of it and look out for their good news feature, um, which shows some of the most uplifting stories from around the world to restore your faith in humanity. I think we all need that sometimes. Um, you can also look closer to home at greensuffolk.org, which publishes news from across Suffolk in relation to the environment. In particular, recently we shared news about the Green Light Trust in Bury St Edmunds and their initiative to encourage us to buy less this Black Friday instead of more, which is great. Um, lastly, I would strongly advise, if you're not already doing so, that you talk about climate change. Find out what your friends think, find out what your family thinks, um, share some of these tips on Facebook. Uh, the more we talk about it, the more we raise awareness and the more people end up coming to webinars like this. Uh, we can't leave it all to David Attenborough. Uh, let's make talking about the climate normal. So my time is nearly up, um, but just to add on, here are some great places you can visit online to find out more. I certainly haven't even scratched the surface in the last 15 minutes. Um, so if you want to do some digging, take a quick photo of this slide and head to some of these websites to explore. Uh, Greensuffolk.org is, as I mentioned, the local resource specifically to find out more about Suffolk. Um, we've also recently started a Facebook group, which I quite like to plug, called Creating the Greenest County Suffolk. It's only small at the minute, um, but I'd love to fill it with wonderful people like yourselves that are interested in making the world a greener, healthier place, starting in Suffolk. Um, it would be great to have you join it. Um, also, if you have any tips on good websites, do post them in the chat. I would love to check them out, and I'm sure other people will here too as well. Um, thank you all kindly for having me. Um, my name is Abigail and I hope you've come away with some useful tips this evening. Um, I believe we have a Q&A coming up, so I'm happy to answer anything you might want to know about being eco-friendly. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. That was really, uh, really some brilliant tips in there and really nice and optimistic. And obviously it's very important to hear, hear from Alex, but it's always good as well to, to hear that there's hope is not lost and there's still small actions we can all take, however, however small. So um, when you when everyone registered for the event there, we did ask uh, if you'd like any questions to submit in advance. So um, thanks to everyone who did. We received uh, dozens and dozens of questions, which was great to see how passionate and curious everyone is about this subject. So rather than try and get through all of them in the limited time we have, we've so I've tried to group them together into some of the most common uh, themes. So um, the first question is for uh, Dave. So this is, a, this is a common one, particularly obviously here in, in Suffolk, Dave. Um, the question was, what can be done to mitigate the impact of coastal erosion on habitats and flooding? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, I actually read the question as um, what can be done to mitigate the impact of coastal erosion and flooding on habitats, but maybe that's a bit of a moot point. Um, but what I wanted to do was really to um, focus on answering this question by um, considering the opportunities that exist around habitat creation as mitigation and really specifically there about um, managed realignment. So if people don't know what managed realignment is, it's it's a mechanism that can restore those coastal habitats that um, suffer as a result of coastal erosion and, and increased storminess. And so it's not, you know, it's not without controversy. It needs to happen in the right place. Um, 
but you know with those rising sea levels and increased storminess as i said there need there needs to be options for um, managed realignment because i don't think it's possible to uh, it's not economically possible to maintain all of our coastal defences everywhere where they have been um, created. So there is a mechanism that um, that it enables decision makers and policy makers to um, help them decide where this might be able to take place. It's called a shoreline management plan and it's a high level strategy for you know managing flood uh, and erosion risk for particular stretches of coastline over a hundred year period. Um, and they identify the best ways to, to manage that coastal flood and erosion risk and you know put right at the top of the tree is the importance to people and property and, and businesses uh, and managed realignment can be identified where um, it is a suitable option for effectively coastal habitats to be recreated where they used to be prior to um, coastal defences being being built up. So it is a fantastic option for um, for habitat creation, benefits all types of um, wildlife, both plants and animals. And there are a number of examples that exist now around the East Coast. And if anyone's interested, they can e email me and I can point you to where those are. Hopefully that's OK. Great, right. thanks Dave. Um... Next question is for Abby. So obviously you've um, given us lots of great tips there. Um, but the question is that we got quite a lot was how can we engage with more people to take climate change seriously? That's a really good question. Um, and as someone who um, works in climate change communications, I I wish I had like the be all end all of answers. Um, but something I think is missing um, a lot in climate change kind of communications and trying to get people involved is um, we talk a lot about, um, so we have the same sort of iconographized imagery, you know, when we think of climate change, we think of polar bears on melting ice caps, we think of wildfires, which to people in the UK is really far away. Um, I think what we should really start doing in climate change communications is talking about climate change and bringing it closer to home. So start talking about what our, our own towns and cities and neighbourhoods will look like as a result of climate change. Um, and that will really sort of give people a sense of more of a sense of personal responsibility um, if you sort of make it a bit more relatable. Um, that's sort of the first thing that comes to mind to answer that question. Um, I hope that's enough enough detail <laughs> yeah no that's great as you say i think um obviously it's um sort of national media and it can tend to focus on sort of um big events around the world you know kind of wildfires and these extreme events and it can often be hard i suppose to relate to people here in the uk but i think uh, you're right the more we can make it a local issue as well as a, a global issue i think mm. we should get that buy-in from from everyone um thank you uh, right next question um is for dave again uh so is there funding available that communities could access to support to support some of the changes that have been talked about uh yeah thanks tom uh, and again I, I read this one to um to mean about supporting changes that people might be able to to make in terms of adapting lifestyles and um and, and that kind of stuff so um, there is currently a, a climate action community match fund pot, which is available through Suffolk County Council. I can put the link um, <clears throat> in the chat for people there. Uh, and this is a, a £150,000 uh, fund available essentially for sort of community action around um, the, the climate emergency. So it's for charities, community interests, companies and parish councils voluntary groups and other sort of um, not-for-profits uh, and, it, and it's really there to sort of support the vision for us as a county um, to become carbon neutral by 2030. So there's lots of different ideas that can be funded there, uh, things like the efficiency of buildings, um, promoting more walking and cycling, using sustainable and recycled materials or things like raising awareness of climate change through events like this 
uh, and, and other bits and pieces. So um, I think the fund supports up to 50% of the costs uh, up to a maximum of £10,000 per project. Um, there's also a number of different funds available through um, the AOMB. And again, I can put a link in the um, in the chat to those projects if people would like to find out a bit more information. Great. Thanks, Dave. Yes, so there's um, both, both the Denham Mayor and the Coast and Heath areas of outstanding natural beauty. We have different grant funds for di of different scales for, to fund community projects. So uh, as Dave says, we'll pop the links in. The, uh, I think we'll probably send a follow up email either uh, in the morning. So I'll make sure we include links to some of these funding opportunities in there. Um, thanks, Dave. So the next question is for Alex. Um, what are the top three things we can do as individuals to support nature and biodiversity? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, what? Yeah, so my, I mean, there's so many things that people can do to help nature and, and biodiversity, um, but my, my top three things, um, I, I would imagine that there are people here that are doing some of these already, but they are, they really are, the, the top three things that, that I can think of. Firstly, you know, we need to sort of practice what we preach. So, and we've, we've got to uh, move away from thinking that nature reserves are going to deliver, they deliver everything for, for wildlife and, and, and nature. They, they, they really are not enough. So we need to be doing what as much as we possibly can at home. And it, it doesn't matter how big your garden is, or if you've got a little courtyard, um, garden or you know tiny space it doesn't matter you can still do really positive things for wildlife and it always amazes me what can turn up in you know some amazing insects and things and birds that they they can they can use your space if you provide all the things that they need you know and, and the things like put in water features put in ponds um and often people say to me oh well i've already got a pond well i just say well why don't you dig another one you know there's no reason why you can't have more than one pond um things like try to be not quite so tidy all the time you know that, that's what wildlife wants to hide away in little habitat piles it wants to hide away under leaves log piles um standing dead wood is amazing for things like stag beetles um you know don't try not to have such a pristine mown lawn you know have little rough areas of of, of grass that where insects and grasshoppers and things can live that provide food for things like hedgehogs um you can really bring your garden to life if you just manage it in a way that is beneficial for a whole variety of, of, of different species and there's so much information out there rspb wildlife trusts websites and and little bits on the aomb websites as well um, and i'm certainly happy to provide anybody with any any advice on on that kind of thing um the the other thing uh, number two i would say is to join a, a wildlife charity if you haven't already rspb wildlife trust greenpeace whatever it happens to be the more um, resources that we can we can get to these organizations the more fantastic amazing work that they're, they're able to do so as I say I imagine lots of you have done that already and if you can afford it join join um, an, a, a charity like that and and the third one would be volunteer find a, a local community orchard or a, a, a local community project nearby that you can go and um, lend a hand and do you know really positive things there um you can go on to nature reserves you can volunteer for the wildlife charities at the aomb we offer the stuff that i offer nature recovery work parties real varied sort of amounts of tasks you can do on there i've got colleagues countryside officers that offer all sorts of things from coppicing to um planting hedges, uh, river restoration work, um, footpath surveys, all kind of things. So if if you want to volunteer and, and make the best use of your time and make a positive difference, then, um, you know, we AOMB certainly offer the opportunities, as do RSPB, Wildlife Trust, National Trust as, as, as well. So that, that would be my three top things. Great. Thanks, Alex. Lots of good stuff in there. Um, yeah, just to say, we we uh, earlier this year we held a wildlife friendly gardening talk like this, um, 
that you can watch again on our website and that contained lots of useful advice in there about um, you know making ponds and making your garden wildlife friendly so do do take a look and I can pop the link in the email tomorrow um, so Dave a uh, question for you um, around energy obviously it's a, it's a hot topic at the moment so how can we balance the need for renewable energy with the impact on habitats and natural beauty well, I'm, I'm tempted to start answering the question by saying that um, by using a sort of tree planting analogy and saying that, you know, where we plant trees, it's right tree, right place. And I think the principle should probably be the same for renewable energy. But I'm I'm going to move to a wider point before I m make a few few more. And that really is around the fact that um, you know, if we don't look at how to um, look after our um, precious world and address the issue of climate change through the use of, you know, more sustainable energy production, then all of those things that we hold dear and all of the things that we heard as a prophecy tonight are much more likely to happen. So, you know, we we really do have to get our house in order and um, more widely employ renewable um, technology. I, I, I'm convinced of that. Um, but having said that, you know, with with the need for renewable energy, we still have a need for biodiversity and beautiful places which exist in the, in the A O N B. You know, nature is a is an integral um, part, an integral element of of natural beauty. So I, I'm going to um, consider new infrastructure. So I think, you know, around new infrastructure and Suffolk is certainly subject to significant proposals for new um, um, uh, NSIPs, uh, nationally significant infrastructure um, projects. Uh, and really, you know, we need to make sure that every possible option has been considered and assessed, you know, before consent's given. So, so really make sure that it's been investigated. Uh, and, you know, it may be uh, that aesthetically it's as simple as careful sighting so as not to interrupt views or perhaps from a, um, a biodiversity point of view, you know, not sighting um, new arrays of, of wind farms you know, on established bird migration flyways, flyways for example. Um, but having said that, you know, we, we do accept widely that, you know, a lot of the companies that are involved and have been involved in um, establishment of renewable energy pro um, projects, you know, recognise the fact that there's been an impact on um, areas of natural beauty. And, you know, there's been a lot of work done over the years to um, look at minimising those impacts and certainly some of the grant schemes that I referred to in my previous answer um, have been made available by some of uh, through, through some of this this work here. Um, and I'm just going to make a point about existing infrastructure as well because I, I did a little bit of re research around this uh, and you know I've learned I've learned a lot tonight already and I, I learned some stuff here that there was a suggestion that um, technology could be used to turn off wind turbines at dawn and dusk when you know bats and birds are more active, mostly on the move, um, doing their migration, doing their, their their feeding, and and those times of day often coincide with lighter winds. So so really, you know, because of the importance of biodiversity. You know, it should be as acceptable to turn those turbines off at that time of day and to be able to cope with it, just as they have to cope with naturally occurring light wind interruptions and being able to cope with that by looking at, um, you know, offsets by more modern technology, backup systems and um, improved energy storage. Um, and the other point I wanted to make is, um, you know, we also ought to look about look at the question of how we increase the efficiency of our own energy use and reduce its demand. 
Um, you know, and again, you know, the message there about the need for better energy storage solutions to enable um, that 100% transition to renewables um, is is really important, I think. So um, I'll, I'll just finish on this question by saying, you know, the question here, how can we balance the need for renewable energy with impacts on habitats and natural beauty isn't that easy to answer, but, you know, there is a choice. Um, but we might also consider the question, how do we balance the unrestrained use of fossil fuels with the impact on habitats and natural beauty? And that's something that we can discuss another time. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, that brings us uh, to the end. So we, we've just passed eight o'clock. So thanks, everyone, for hanging on a couple of minutes over over time. Um, yeah, it's been a lot of really useful information tonight. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, there's obviously a lot of a uh, lot of information thrown at you. So thanks everyone for staying to the end. And hopefully, again, we we were obviously unable to answer everyone's question, but hopefully you've got enough information to go away and make small small steps yourself. Um, as mentioned, obviously there's been a lot of links and informations and references um, mentioned. So. I'll send a follow up email to everyone tomorrow and I'll try and include links to all these different uh, documents and grants and resources. Um, so yeah, I think that that's everything. So thanks again to everyone. Um, we're looking to hopefully organise more of these events in the future. So um, thanks a lot for your support and we'll see you all again soon. Thanks everyone.